tonight. We've got stuff in the sky to look at, but of course, and Deneb and Cygnus the Swan are still up there. But today's forecast is for tomorrow, before dawn. Oh, yawn, grab that coffee or whatever wakes you up in the morning. Go out and see if you can see this. If you're an early riser, look for the waning crescent moon near the sky's brightest planet, Venus, and that red star, Aldebaran. This star is the brightest in the constellation Taurus the Bull. It represents the bull's fiery eye. The July 19th morning moon is also in the vicinity of the Pleiades star cluster, also known as the Seven Sisters, and also in Taurus. If you go out too close to the sunrise, you might not see Aldebaran or the Pleiades. Your sky will already be too bright. But you'll easily spot the moon and Venus, both of which are shining in front of Taurus the Bull right now. After all, the moon and Venus rate as the second brightest and third brightest celestial objects, respectively, after our sun. Aldebaran is a bright red star, but it's not the only bright red star in our night sky. Aldebaran shines virtually opposite 180 degrees of the red supergiant star Antares, the bright red star in the constellation Scorpius the Scorpion. Antares is in fact called the Scorpion's Heart. Because they're opposite each other on the dome of sky, though, you won't see Aldebaran and Antares in the same sky together. For example, Aldebaran won't be visible tonight. Meanwhile, Aldebaran's counterpart, Antares, pops into view just as soon as darkness falls. With each successive day, Antares sets four minutes earlier, while Aldebaran rises two hours earlier. So, as the days and weeks roll by, Antares spends less time in the evening sky after sunset, while Aldebaran spends more in the morning sky before sunrise. By the time December finally arrives, Aldebaran will be out all night long, and Antares will just be lost in the glare of the sun. We in the Northern Hemisphere associate Antares with the hot season, because we see this star on summer evenings. And in winter, we associate Aldebaran with the cold season, because, well, yep, we see this star on winter evenings. In the Southern Hemisphere, of course, the opposite is true. Antares is a winter star for those guys, and Aldebaran is their summer star. Bottom line, the moon is waning in the pre-dawn sky. It's close to the Pleiades star cluster, the red star Aldebaran, and the planet Venus, before dawn, July 19th, tomorrow, 2017. So if you hit the hay extra early tonight, well, you can roll out of bed early enough to see that tomorrow morning. Good luck. Speaking of luck, it looks as though NASA's citizen science program is a success, at least so far. Here's a headline. Citizen scientists discover new brown dwarf. This gets a byline for Brooks Hayes, who writes it for United Press International. Quote, I'm not a professional. I'm just an amateur astronomer appreciating the night sky. End quotes. That's from citizen scientist Rosa Castro. Here's the story. Astronomers' inventory of brown dwarfs is growing, thanks to the diligent work of citizen scientists. As part of the NASA-funded Backyard Worlds, Planet Nine project, four citizen scientists helped identify a new brown dwarf. It's called WISEAYZYZ, and the numbers and letters are these. J110125.95 plus... 540052.8. That was detailed this week in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. The four amateur astronomers are listed as co-authors. One of the citizen scientists is Rosa Castro. Rosa, by day, is a therapist, but she spends many nights scanning flip books, those time-lapse space image collections. Like the hundreds of other citizen scientists working on the Backyard Worlds project, Rosa Castro is looking for even the slightest anomaly among the space images, a sign that NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, that's the wise part, infrared images may have documented the transit of a fast-moving object. Here's her quote. I am not a professional, I'm just an amateur astronomer appreciating the night sky. If I see something odd, I'll admire and enjoy it, end quotes. The NASA Backyard World Project was originally drafted to aid the search for a mysterious object, that possible ninth planet located beyond the orbit of Neptune. 
Quote, we realized we could do a much better job identifying Planet Nine if we opened this search to the public. That's from research leader Mark Kuchner, an astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. He continued, quote, along the way, we're hoping to find thousands of interesting brown dwarfs, end quote. And yes, as you might have figured, the computer algorithms do most of the searching for exoplanets, but even the best analytical models are still not all that efficient. However, scanning hundreds of thousands of images just isn't feasible for a full-time astronomer. Enter crowdsourcing. Citizen scientists can devote as much or as little time into scanning images as they want. When they see something peculiar, they can make a note for astronomers to check it out. The project has already helped astronomers identify dozens of brown dwarf candidates. Here's a quote from Adam Schneider. He's an astronomer out of Arizona State University. Quote, What's special about this object, besides the way it was discovered, is that it's unusually faint. That means our citizen scientists are probing much deeper than anyone has before. End quotes. Researchers hope the citizen scientists project will soon locate a rare group of small, cold brown dwarfs. They're called Y dwarfs. Quote, they're so faint that it's quite a bit of work to pull them from the images, and that's where this project will help immensely, end quotes. That's from Adam Bergasser. He's a researcher from the University of California, San Diego. He continued, quote, anytime you get a diverse set of people looking at the data, they'll bring unique perspectives that can lead to unexpected discoveries, end quotes. So, the Backyard World Project. There'll be a link embedded in this article. If you're inclined to get involved, do it. You can find that link later at ufoheadlinenews.com. Yes, yes, it's radio, and we don't have the visuals for you, but we do have the links to this headline. Colorful photos show auroras dancing in skies around the world last weekend. Miriam Kramer writes this for Mashable. Green and purple curtains of light danced in the skies around the world last weekend. The strong aurora showing was sparked by a mass of hot plasma burped from the sun and sent on a crash course with Earth. And while the auroras weren't particularly strong in the New England states and some other parts of the United States, these curtains of lights did put on a good show for people in the high altitudes of the southern and northern hemispheres. In fact, scientists at research stations in Antarctica even caught sight of these southern lights. Auroras occur when streams of charged particles are sent out from the sun to the rest of the solar system. These particles can impact Earth's magnetic field and get drawn down into the planet's upper atmosphere. Once in that atmosphere, these solar particles can interact with neutral particles, creating the glowing lights we call auroras. Most of the time, auroras can only be seen in a relatively small part of the world because the bits of solar plasma are drawn down along magnetic field lines. But sometimes, when solar storms are more intense, the oval of the aurora can become larger, bathing other parts of the world in green, purple, and red light. Well, red light here on Earth means stop, green light is a go, and Japan has a go with this. Here's the headline. Japan made a floating camera for the space station, and it sure is adorable. It, the int ball looks like it walked right out of the film Wall-E and into your heart, says Andrew Moseman, who writes this article for popularmechanics.com, the space division. This cute floating orb, and of course there will be photos of said cute floating orb, you can find them later at ufoheadlinenews.com, this orb is an astronaut's new best friend. The int ball, that's spelled I-N-T dash B-A-L-L, made by the Japanese space agency JAXA, moves autonomously around the International Space Station. JAXA people on the ground can remotely drive the little ball, too, and use it to capture life aboard the station. In fact, they just released the first images and video. International Space Station astronauts spend a surprising amount of their time, JAXA says 10% overall, filming and photographing things because they need to track the progress on a project or check the status of something that might need to be fixed, for example. If a friendly floating robot can do that job, the thinking goes, then astronauts have far more time for something else. Well, how does little Intbot move around, you say? Well, Engadget says this, quote, 
the cube-shaped brain converses with 12 fans positioned near the surface of the robot, which adjust its position in zero gravity. A navigation camera looks out for pink, quote, 3D target makers, end quotes, which serve as reference points on board the ship. The recording camera, meanwhile, is located between the two eyes so that astronauts can easily identify what it's looking at, end quotes. Little Intball hitched a ride to the space station in June aboard a Japanese capsule propelled by a SpaceX rocket. And Andrew Moseman closes this article by saying, Have fun up there, little guy. Here's something that could be fun down here. It's an article written by Nat Berman for a wonderful website called tvovermind.com. He's talking about the show UFO Files Revisited. Here we go. What can you expect from the television show and title UFO Files Revisited? If you happen to be interested in this sort of thing, oh yes, gentle listeners, aren't we all, you will probably be interested in watching the show. Obviously, the show is going to deal with some of the most widely known cases of UFO sightings, looking at different possibilities for why these sightings have occurred and why they continue to happen all over the world. First and foremost, understand that this is a show that's similar in nature to a lot of the other television shows of this type. Some people are willing to say that these shows have no merit whatsoever, and that everything is made up from beginning to end. Others are more inclined to argue about that point of view, saying that the shows are actually here to educate the public, while simultaneously entertaining them. Without a doubt, This is a television show that talks about real incidents that have been reported. If you really want to know more about the way that these incidents have been investigated, you can always do some of your own research to either back up or debunk the claims made by this show. Oh, they're on the same page as we are. By all accounts, this is a show that seems to take things in a step-by-step fashion while trying to make some type of sense out of the UFO encounters that people claim to have had. Therefore, you can expect individuals that report encounters to be interviewed in this show, along with some reenactments to make the show itself more entertaining so you don't lose interest. Like most shows of its type, expect to have some individuals that are considered experts on the subject to provide some commentary, even including information that they uncovered while doing research. In some cases, the people that actually have the sighting are interviewed, and in other cases there are those reenactments, yep, dramatic recreations, done when people would prefer not to be in front of the camera. Therefore, you can find a mixture of something that is both entertaining and educational, not to mention being somewhat different from the typical things you might find on television. If you really like to follow what's going on in the UFO community, this is a good way to get your feet wet, see what it's all about. By the same token, it works just as well if you're looking for something that's just a little bit different and you're bored with the things that you typically find on television. However, if you're looking for something that's based on hardcore science, says Nat Berman, you're probably going to be skeptical about the show. With that being said, people that fit into this category are typically skeptical about any show that deals with anything like UFOs, the paranormal, or anything else that's remotely fit into that category. However, that doesn't mean that you can't tune in anyway, get a decent dose of entertainment for your time. All in all, you can expect a more detailed and in-depth version of previous shows of this type. When it's all said and done, you might be able to learn something new. Yup, UFO Files Revisited. We'll give it a watch. Why not? Keep an eye on your local listings. Here's a listing. It's a UFO sighting from the folks at ufostalker.com. This one takes place in Grapevine, Texas. MUFON gave it a case number, 85172. The date of this sighting is the 15th of July, 2017. It didn't get reported till July 17th. Here's the summary. UFO overhaul Johnston Road and the 121 in Texas. Forgive this crazy video. I was totally flabbergasted. I was at the salon of my hairstylist. We were talking about our favorite topics, 
extraterrestrials, when out of the clear blue sky, we spotted this flying object. It's time for Optimum's Red Hot Sale. Get 200 meg internet, TV with over 260 channels, and unlimited home phone, all for $69.99 a month for one year guaranteed. And for a limited time, HBO and Showtime are included for one year. Switch today. Click for details and special web-only offers. Yep, that's the summary. There's video included and a still shot. The sighting specifics here include an unknown viewing distance, an altitude of over 500 feet underneath cloud cover. The sighting duration was 11 seconds, and the object features are described as unknown. Oh boy, howdy, as they say in Texas, are they unknown. The flight path was hovering and then path, and then a path with directional change. And this object had a shape that's described as other. Mm. The weather details include a maximum temperature in Grapevine, Texas of 94 degrees Fahrenheit, 34 degrees Celsius, down to a minimum of 79 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 degrees Celsius. The visibility factor is nothing unusual. The standard 10 miles, 16 kilometers, down to a minimum of 7 miles, 11 kilometers. Here's the short but intriguing account. I was getting my hair styled, and the suite has large plate glass windows. My hairstylist spotted the object first, and then we both walked up to the window, and I began filming this object. It reminded me, in fact, of a Dementor from the Harry Potter films. It changed shapes, and then direction, and at one point it resembled a huge creature with wings. We both walked outside to continue watching this object. It moved west until it was out of our view. We both were awestruck. Oh, gentle listeners, as we heard in the summary, they were talking about their favorite topic, UFOs and aliens. That's timing. We think that this particular sighting is a good candidate to toss into that basket. We mark conscious contact. Take a look at the visuals. Form your own conclusion. Our trajectory now shifts to the state of Oklahoma, the city of Tulsa. That's where MUFON case number 85173 took place. The date of this sighting was back in June, the 10th of June this year. Nobody reported it until the 17th of July. Here's the summary. I was sitting on my porch and observed an object flying upward. I started recording the object with my cell phone. Yep, there is video footage recorded from this event. You can find it later at ufoheadlinenews.com. Sighting specifics give a viewing distance unknown. The altitude was over 500 feet, and there wasn't any cloud cover. The sighting duration was 1 minute and 20 seconds, and yet the object features get that unknown report. The flight path was a path that included directional change, and this object was shaped like an egg. The weather in Tulsa, Oklahoma at that time, maximum temperature, 89 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, a minimum temperature of 69 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 degrees Celsius. Those visibility factors, all three of them, maximum, mean, and minimum, tracked the same, 10 miles, 16 kilometers. And at the time of this event, there was nothing abnormal about the weather. Here is the event in the first-person words from our witness. On June 10, 2017, I was at home sitting on my porch looking at the stars in the sky. I then noticed a big ball of light ascending upward into the sky. At first I thought it was a star until I noticed that it was flying and very fast. So I took out my cell phone and started to record. The object was big. It looked like a ball of glowing solid light. I watched the object fly upwards for about 20 seconds, and then it disappeared. And then it reappeared after two seconds. It was going in a different direction. I continued to record this object flying again. Every time it disappeared, it would stay disappeared for about three seconds and then reappear. This object seemed to stop. It changed directions. On my video, you can actually see another object that seems to be flying in different directions as well, almost as if these two objects were playing with each other. I then continued to record until the big ball of light disappeared for good. After the object disappeared for the last time, I sat on my porch, looking in the sky, waiting for this object to reappear, but it never did. I really couldn't believe what I had just witnessed. 
that's when it's cool to have something like a shot, a photograph, a still shot, video, something, so that you can look at it, study it, and say, yep, I did see this. At warp speed, let's go from Oklahoma to North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina, MUFON case number 85087. The date of this sighting is the 13th of July, and it got a next day report. 2017 is the year. Here's the summary. Weird flying saucer-shaped orbs hovering off the coast of Emerald Isle, North Carolina. And indeed, there are photos of this event. You can find them later at ufoheadlinenews.com. Sighting specifics give us a viewing distance unknown, also an altitude unknown. The sighting duration was one hour and 20 minutes. These object features are described as domes, wings, and unknown. Its flight path was stationary, and then hovering, and then path. And this object had a shape described as Saturn-like. Here's the account. My family and family friends and I were sitting on our deck, looking out over the ocean, when we noticed a glowing spaceship-shaped row of lights hovering above the ocean. It was in front of us. Another set of lights appeared out of nowhere, and the two sets of lights looked like two different objects hovering close to each other. After a while, they disappeared. Later on, they reappeared further and to the left of us. They were closer to the pier, and yet they looked about the same distance as they were before. This usually would start with one set of lights and then another appearing, and we've seen this before. But this time, after the second set disappeared, one set of lights disconnected and started hovering one a little far above the other. The one on the bottom seemed to have fallen into the ocean, and then the other one disappeared. Then again, these things show up later. Three other people drove to the pier. We walked to the end of it, where there were many people fishing. We asked some of the people what they thought we saw, and they said it was probably a barge ship. Even after we explained to them that these things we watched were far above the water flying over the ocean, and we told them how the lights disappeared and reappeared in different spots. Some people were looking, but most weren't paying any attention to the odd, hovering, disappearing lights. They just kept fishing. After these lights disappeared again, we went home. We found out later it's common to see mysterious glowing lights and orbs in the sky in Emerald Isle, North Carolina. And that seems odd, because there's loud jets that fly by often. I'm guessing these jets come from a government base nearby, and maybe these lights are associated with the government. I'm not sure, but this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And some people on the pier acted as if nothing was going on. Most of them were saying these things were boats, even though the lights were clearly far above the horizon. And also, they show up terrible in pictures. They looked a lot bigger in person. It's fascinating to this broadcaster, the locals just don't pay much attention to flashing dancing lights over Emerald Isle, North Carolina. That is a mystery for another time, perhaps. We can see by all the clocks, all the time zones in the world, we've got to fly because that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Inception Radio Network. Follow this broadcast at ufoheadlinenews.com. Take care of each other. We're all in this together. This is Carol Carl. See you tomorrow.